From South Carolina Public Radio, this is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on January 9th, 2023 from A.T. Shire's house. Just so you know, some of the information in this podcast may have changed by the time you've heard it. Now, you're probably wondering, weren't they just back in the studio? Why are they back at A.T.'s house? That last episode sounded so good. Well, we had a long Monday, folks. I even got A.T. out and about in the field because we had a special situation going on at the State House. The South Carolina Press Association hosted their annual legislative workshop with the media. So we had an all day taping essentially. And well, things went long. That's why we're here recording it in our shorts and tank tops. <laughs> That's because this episode features a long politics section. If you like long clips, get ready folks, because we're continuing our preview of the 2023 legislative session. Like I said, on Monday, January 9th, the South Carolina Press Association held its annual media legislative workshop where reporters from across the state spent a day hearing from chairmen from several House and Senate committees, as well as the Senate Republican and Democratic caucus leaders. It was an all-day affair that I moderated, which spanned a variety of topics and predictions for the session. But the primary focus of questions centered around what lawmakers will do with abortion legislation, since the state Supreme Court ruled the six-week abortion ban is unconstitutional. The next steps, as well as the upcoming Supreme Court election by lawmakers for a new justice, will be closely watched. We look at other priorities for lawmakers, including trying to curb fentanyl overdose deaths, education reforms and funding, criminal justice reforms, and the budget. Now, of course, the lead loves to hear from you all. That's why we have our voicemail box set up at 803-563-7169. We want to hear from you guys. Give us your hot takes, what's on your mind, unpopular opinions, popular opinions, shows that we need to watch all that good stuff. Maybe your thoughts on what the top legislative priorities should be for the lawmakers in Columbia. We'd love to hear them, 803-563-7169. Now for latest in South Carolina, currently the spread of COVID-19 is high according to county level data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we'll have updated data for you from DHEC in Saturday's episode. If you listened to our last episode, you know that the state Supreme Court ruled 3-2 to two last week to find the state's six-week abortion law violated Article 1, Section 2 of the state's Constitution, which provides for a right to privacy. The abortion lawsuit filed by Planned Parenthood South Atlantic overturned the so-called fetal heartbeat law, which was signed into law in February 2021, but was blocked by federal courts until Roe v. Wade was overturned in June. The law briefly went into effect for several weeks before Planned Parenthood's suit. Following the overturning of Roe, lawmakers received hours of testimony and held debate in the House and Senate over more restrictive legislation during the summer and fall. If you listen to our podcasts, you'll remember that. However, the votes just weren't there to end a filibuster in the Senate, where 30 Republicans hold the majority to 16 Democrats. But Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey said options are being considered, but a referendum would be difficult since our state law doesn't directly allow for ballot initiatives. Here's Shane Massey. Look, I think it's pretty clear, isn't it, that South Carolinians are pretty divided on the issue. I think I think everybody understands that. But, you know, there's no way you're going to convince me that a large majority of South Carolinians support abortion being legal with no restrictions for five months. And that's what the Supreme Court just gave us. Um, so I, I don't even think most Democrats would support abortion being legal with no restrictions for five months. So uh, there's going to be a response. Um, we've got to figure out what the best way to respond is. Sir Massey, can you drill down a little bit about the referendum question? We were talking about that earlier today, and it's obviously not a very straightforward process in South Carolina, but it was introduced. There were amendments introduced during the abortion debate special session that were shot down over that. Do you think that's going to be maybe one of the more logical pathways here? I don't know. That's an idea. Um, I mean, look, what, about 20 years ago or so, Tennessee had an adverse ruling, and they responded to that with a constitutional amendment that basically just says that their right to privacy clause doesn't apply to abortion. Um, that's something that we could we could think about uh, and see what what, what the voters th- think about that. Because you know, look, there's. I mean, I've re- I've read through the opinion. There, there's no way that you can convince me that two thirds of the legislature, in which the House and the Senate, in 1970, thought this is what they were doing. 
there's no way you'll convince me that 77% of South Carolinians who voted in November of 1970, when they voted to approve this constitutional amendment, had any inkling that this is what they were approving, right? If that's not what they intended to pass, that's not what it means. Um, so so th that's, that to me is, is a big deal. Right? That's not what they were told. That's not what South Carolinians were told they were, they were voting on. And I think that, that should matter. Um, now, I don't think that South Carolina would vote to ban abortion outright, um, but I also don't think they would vote to support five months unrestricted. Senate Minority Leader Brad Hutto said his 16 Democrats can't affect change when it comes to legislating this issue, but that the court had spoken and its decision should be respected. Well, as usual, the court does what the court wants to do, but uh, you know, I, I agree with Senator Massey. It is a quite lengthy opinion, and I've, I've read parts of it. I have not read the entire uh, opinion, but uh, to me, it's not unexpected. I mean, I've always known we had a right to privacy in our Constitution, and the question of how far it extended was one for judicial interpretation, and they've now let us know what the ruling of our Supreme Court is, and we'll have to react to that accordingly if we're going to make any changes uh, to the abortion law. Um, it, to me, I, I, at least for now, interpret it to mean that you can't have an outright ban, you can't have restrictions, and the question is the reasonableness, the balancing test of the restrictions, and uh, I guess others may debate uh, whether that's exactly what the Supreme Court said or not, but uh, we, I, I agree, we're still digesting that, and, and uh, you won't see our side uh, uh, introducing any restrictions on abortion. I've, in fact, I have introduced a bill that would codify Roe versus Wade so we would know what the law is. I think uh, the women of South Carolina um, expect that we will respect them, respect their ability uh, to make their own decisions. I at least hope that that's what we would do. It may be that we'll go the route of Kansas and just put it on the ballot. I mean, that's what happened in Kansas. They actually tried to amend their Constitution to add restrictions, and the, the voters of Kansas rejected it. I would predict to you that if it was put on the ballot here, the voters of South Carolina would reject it as well. Hutto was the only Democrat at the media workshop since all House and Senate committee chairmen are Republicans, and his counterpart, Todd Rutherford, did not attend. But Lexington Republican Senator Katrina Shealy said it will be difficult to pass anything like the House was pushing last year since she and several other Republicans were not in favor of a near total abortion ban or any ban that doesn't provide for exceptions. You know, I think that if that comes back up, we won't get anything done. I think we need to work on other legislation first, but I'm sure that it will come back up. And, um, you know, I'm going to work real hard to get legislation that matters to people. I think we have to work on issues for our, our roads and our... Um, economy and what matters to everybody and you know we spent two sessions three sessions working on something that we know we st still don't have the votes in the senate to get it passed and i don't know how many times you can say the same thing over and over again and still get the same response but i think in in somebody's world that's called insanity so you know it should be the same thing in our world so i think we need to work on things that can move forward that's my answer to your question. With the 3-2 to two Supreme Court ruling, there have also been concerns expressed that Republicans will reform the judicial selection process, which involves candidates for Supreme Court down to lower benches. The process is kind of convoluted, maybe you don't know it, but it includes candidates being screened and approved by the Judicial Merit Selection Committee. Then candidates solicit lawmakers for votes during an approved time period, and then House and Senate lawmakers get together to elect judges, like they will in early February including for retiring Supreme Court Justice Kay Hearn's seat. Hearn is the only woman on the five-member high court and the author of the primary majority opinion that found that the state's constitutional right to privacy included a woman's right to an abortion. Chief Justice Don Beatty was expected to and did side with Hearn, but Justice John Cannon Few swung the majority, with Justices George James and John Kittredge dissenting. The current judicial screening process doesn't involve judges being asked about their worldview or judicial philosophy, something Senator Massey said could be in the offing. Our judicial elections have always been pretty, um, pretty straightforward as well. And, and I do think that, that some of the decisions we've had recently have had an impact to change that world a little bit. Um, 
But I think going forward, I will be amazed if you don't see a political pushback on on the way that we've been doing this. Um, it, it, um, I hope it doesn't go the way of Washington. I don't like that. But look, we're going to have to do a better job of screening some of the judicial candidates uh, because I don't think that they are screened for philosophy. Um, we're going to have to do a better job of that um, or else we're going to get a, a lot of pushback from the public about some of these decisions because I think Look, I think this is a really bad decision on the merits. I think they, they completely created a right that heretofore had not existed. And as I mentioned earlier, the people who approved it never could have imagined this was going to happen. House Republicans were also keeping their options open in how to proceed. Restrictive abortion legislation that came out of the House was not able to pass the Senate during the special session last fall. Here's House Speaker Pro Tem Tommy Pope. From what I've seen and heard with the members, I think there's there's two areas or areas of concern. I think there's um, the need to determine after reading, I, I joked, I said 160 pages. That's probably doubled what I read when I was in law school total. You know, but, uh, but um, you know, trying to really get a grasp of what um, um, each justice was saying and, and, you know, recognizing where we're at. Uh, will determine our best course forward. You know, when you read Justice Few's opinion, it, it was both this is too restrictive, but you could ban everything. And so it's, we're going to have some interesting discussions, but I think it's important that we be armed with this much understanding as what the court said. The second area is um, I think there's a, there's always been an interest. I think there, there will probably be a renewed interest in, in the, our judicial process and how we choose our, our judges. And we'll be right back with more comments from top House and Senate lawmakers about what priorities they see for this session, including education, what to do with an additional $3.6 billion that they'll have to budget with, and fighting the fentanyl crisis that has claimed more than 1,000 South Carolinians in 2020 alone. Now, believe me, lawmakers were very eager to talk about other things as well besides abortion. There are a host of other priorities that need to be addressed during the first year of this two-year legislative session, including more education funding, especially for teachers, and reforms such as education scholarship accounts, which functions similar to a voucher program. A bill, S-39, looks at such a measure and is before the full Senate Education Committee this week. Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey said that this was a priority for the chamber since a similar bill made it through both chambers last session. Regardless of which year it is, uh, education is the number one issue. If you believe like I do and like many of us do that your priorities are where you put your money, education is clearly the number one issue. Now, we could, we could, dis we could debate whether we spend enough money here or we spend enough money there, but it's clear that we spend most of South Carolinians tax money on education. Um, we're going to start with education scholarship accounts. As Senator Hutto mentioned, we, we had a, a good debate about that. We had a lot of work in the subcommittee and the committee level, both Senator Hutto and I served on the subcommittee. We spent a lot of time on that last year. We'll spend some more time on that this year. There is more than $3.5 billion extra for lawmakers to budget with this coming fiscal year. And that means we'll see some big investments in improving infrastructure and education priorities. Two big themes in Governor Henry McMaster's executive budget released last week. And themes supported by newly selected House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Bruce Bannister of Greenville. For a long time, maybe the governor's budget didn't get as much attention as it has been getting recently. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been nice to have a collaborative sort of discussion ahead of time, uh, and Governor McMaster has been really good about reaching out and talk about what money is available, what we could really do, uh, what are the challenges. I think that you'll see something very similar to what the governor proposed for teachers and law enforcement. I think his investment in bridges and economic development will be mirrored in the House budget. Uh, I think you'll see a lot of similarities, uh, and that won't be an accident. I mean, we've been working with his staff and, and him to figure out what, what those priorities are going to be and what we can agree on in advance uh, would be a good place to put the money. 
The state's tax base grew by some $750 million from the previous year and paired with one-time dollars totaling $2.9 billion. That gets us to that 3.5, 3.6 number. Frank Rainwater, executive director of the state's Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Office, briefed reporters about the additional funds. Now, Rainwater notes that the revenue growth is fueled by more folks moving to the state, higher wages, and higher corporate tax collections, whereas one-time dollars remain from years of COVID stimulus spending that has since tapered. With revenue expected to eventually come back down to earth and projected growth trends returning to normal, the office is also keeping an eye on interest rate increases by the Federal Reserve Bank as it seeks to tamp down inflation, which could lead to a potential recession impacting revenues. But Rainwater isn't too worried. We, we've uh, taken that into account in our revenue forecast, and, and we have worked with a panel of advisors to help us judge that. And so we've, we've cautiously, in our, our budget, we've assumed there's going to be somewhat of a downturn with that, too, excuse me, in our revenue forecast. Um, in addition to that, we have a lot of reserves. Uh, as you see there, the state currently has in the bank uh, $1.2 billion from last year in the contingency reserve fund. Our capital reserve fund and general reserve fund are fully funded. So about, about over $700 million in the two reserve funds. Plus, we're running ahead by $1.2 billion this year. And so we've got to fall off the cliff this year uh, by $1.2 billion and then go further down in there. Um, but again, we have a lower revenue forecast built in for next year. And um, so we've been wa wa waiting, we are not anticipating, but we've taken that into account of a downturn. It's kind of just the opposite, or excuse me, not the opposite, but the opposite conclusion. We've been growing great. We just don't believe that's sustainable. And so we're, we're expecting this turn to happen. And we've, we've been expecting it to happen sooner than later, and it has not happened for two years, but uh, we'll find out when we get December revenues and January revenues to see if it started. Lawmakers were also united in fighting the opioid epidemic, specifically the rise in deaths from the synthetic opioid fentanyl. According to the Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services, 1,734 South Carolinians died from a drug overdose in 2020. Of those, 1,400 were related to opioids and 1,100 involved fentanyl. House Speaker Merle Smith has previously said that combating this problem will be his top priority, and Senate President Thomas Alexander has pre-filed a bill, S-1, that will create a drug-induced homicide charge should someone provide drugs to someone that results in their death. Here's President Alexander. What we did with uh, the fentanyl legislation that I've been interested in for, for several years, um, and the latest figures that we have on that, or at least the latest that I have, are from 2020, that the number of deaths that were fentanyl-related were 1,100 in death, uh, 1,100 deaths, um, uh, and that is a, over 100% increase from the previous year, from 19 to 20 of deaths in South Carolina. And this simply is not acceptable. Um, and, and there are three components of that legislation, as I see it. Uh, one will criminalize the delivery, dispensing, uh, or providing of fentanyl to another person. Uh, the other aspect is a person convicted by fentanyl-induced homicide must be imprisoned up to a maximum of 30 years. And it also adds a scientific definition of fentanyl-related substances. And as we went through the committee and went through judiciary, I think Senate, uh, Chairman Rankin and all the members of the, of the judiciary of moving that legislation last year as it went through subcommittee and committee, it was a lot of work that was done that got us to that point that uh, I believe that also uh, maybe passed unanimously or close to unanimous uh, in the Senate last year. The governor has also proposed in his budget sending $5 million in non-recurring funds to Deotis to combat the addiction crisis by ensuring continued access to essential treatment services, reducing unmet treatment need, and reducing overdose-related deaths through the provision of prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery activities for opioid use disorder. The governor also has an additional $3 million in one-time dollars to go toward a new center of excellence in addiction which will be coordinated by Deotis in partnership with DHEC, the Medical University of South Carolina, the University of South Carolina, and Clemson. The new center will evaluate interventions and treatment programs for their efficacy, then use South Carolina's portion of the National Opioid Settlement Funds to support the most efficacious programs. Moving to something completely different, one question I did have was to Bill Sandifer, 
chairman of the House Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee, about the electrification of our grid to support the onslaught of electric vehicles that are being deployed on roadways nationwide. With more to come as vehicle manufacturers, including several in South Carolina, pivot away from internal combustion engines. Sandifer said charging and transportation infrastructure needs to be addressed. We've got several things that we need to take into consideration. One is the availability of the charging stations. Where are they going to be? Are they going to be in neighborhoods, on the interstate, or only at service stations along the interstate? So that's a big part of it. The other is how do we charge for the electric use? because somebody has to pay for it. And so we have to be able to modulate that and determine how much is used by each vehicle so that they can be charged on a credit card just like we do gasoline. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. But we're looking also at the advent of the, the electric vehicles because of the lack of carbon dioxide emissions, all of those things are beneficial to our state. And the big elephant in the House is the role of the House Freedom Caucus, a growing group of far-right Republicans looking to flex their influence in decisions in the House. Speaker Pro Tem Tommy Pope, who was second in charge in the House to Speaker Merle Smith, and occasionally oversees House operations like votes, roll calls, etc., has previously spoken about the need for the chamber not to become Washington, and recent events, such as U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's drawn-out election last week, was a case study on the matter. I I think that uh, we've got the chance to work together. The world, and and starting with Washington, and we have resisted as long as we could in Columbia, we're all about the soundbite instead of the substance. I mean, you know, we worked together across the aisles, but the truth is, when when I got elected back in the day, you know, it was Republican versus Democrat, not Republican versus Rhino versus pure Republican. And so, um, if we could take a breath and take a step back and quit worrying about who got the credit <coughs> and how I got a got you moment with you, instead do the people's work, then you would find out that the lion's share of the time. We agree with each other on most issues, on our side of the aisle, and truthfully, oftentimes across the aisle. But it, it's people are too worried about credit and too worried about uh, the gotcha moment. And um, I mean, you had an interesting Washington case study on these issues in the last couple of days. And you know, did it have a good result or not? I guess that remains to be seen based on the effectiveness of what happens in Washington. So yes, everything might sound simple now and you think it might go one way, but there is still a lot at play and things can change even when you have strong majorities in both chambers. But we'll be here keeping you updated every week. Welcome to the wind down section, our little break from the news, and we're glad you're here. This is our time to talk about what's going on with y'all, <laughs> issues you have. I'm trying to do new intros here, <laughs> and we're glad you're here. Oh, man. It's very it's, soothing. Uh, Don't let me stop you. Just keep going. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about issues you have, hot takes, or observations you think we need to be made aware of. Let us know, 803-563-7169. I've, uh, we've redone a lot of language in the podcast. We still have to redo the voicemail <laughs> greeting, but... Baby steps, okay? It's a, it's lot, a lot going it's a on for us. a lot of legal steps. Oh, we, so much We got legal. a lot of lawyers involved. Uh-huh. Um, so it's not as easy as changing a voicemail anymore. Not when you're as popular as Gavin and I are, because yeah. it's grounds for suit. Yeah. You know? It's, it's, it's maritime. Well, you don't even... I just, I want every listener to know that we're really putting our necks out there for you. Okay? <laughs> like, we, we're really, really, it's dangerous, dangerous ground what we're but, doing here. One thing you can do to help support is oh, give us a call. Give us a call. Hit him the number again. Yeah, three five six seven six nine. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Gavin, today you took me out on the road. We had a little field trip. Yes, didn't we? I I got so if you're listening and you think of the lead as a little peek behind a curtain of how politics in the state house work here in South Carolina. I got a real peek behind the peek behind the curtain. Yeah, double curtains. There's a there's a there's another wizard of oz. <laughs> there's another one behind that one basically. Yes. And so uh it was it was a real eye opener for me to see how this works, the interplay, the relationship 
of the reporters with the people who run the state house, mm-hmm. the, the the elected officials. Yeah, and um, you know, I had to moderate this whole thing, so I was standing for four hours all day. <laughs> One no thing brag. I would say is Gavin did stand for four hours <laughs> because they couldn't get him there a stool. There was no stool. <laughs> there was no stool in the building. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely some sort of media thing there. No. I think they need next budget, next house budget. We didn't ask them, but you should have asked if they had room for a stool for you. I had a good podium and a good leaning situation, so it really never, like, I was never dying, but uh, it, was, it was getting old, and I'm glad we're reclined. Mm-hmm. Or I, I should say I'm glad I'm horizontal doing this taping. <laughs> but, yeah, that was a lot because it was an all-day thing. Um, AT is usually, you know, he, he sometimes were on different assignments sometimes, but, you mm-hmm. know, we obviously did the – the spook pod together so you know what goes into all that too yes. scripting but like usually i give at these clips and he he ties them up we, we oh, work yeah. together we it's, have things it's preened and picked and cherry picked and perfect just for me so i just hear these little clips and then today uh, since i had a moderate i was like oh my, my at i think you need to come and just kind of keep an eye on the recording because there's no way i could have put you this episode together yeah. and keep track mm-hmm. uh it would have been messy so i appreciate you being out there today but yeah a little little trip you know got you out and about i yeah meg meg said the only reason she meg canard Friend of the pod. Friend of the pod. She said she only came because she heard that my leg was, it was like a debutante's ball for my leg. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I was excited to see her. I haven't seen her since the incident. The you incident. Know? So uh, it, that was, that was a lot of fun. You, and we got you in a collared shirt. That was exciting. Oh, I hated it. I looked like a janitor. <laughs> <laughs> you were going for a very monochrome look, which you pulled off. <laughs> I wear all black all the time. And it's not because I'm trying to be Steve Jobsy or anything like mm-hmm. that. It's just I do own a lot of black things. When you're into heavy metal, you got black shirts. It comes okay? with the territory. They'll know that you're not if you don't wear black. Exactly. I mean, you can. I, I can't show up there in, in like pastels. But at you've, well, I guess besides kickball, that was a black shirt. But you rarely have seen me wear black. But I can tell you one day <laughs> if you even know what black is. I. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm subjected to with the. This is why I don't want to talk about my colorblind <laughs> lack of vision. I can tell black. It's just the different shades between black and <laughs> okay, blue. Okay. Allegedly. But you can see me wear a black shirt at our upcoming live taping. Oh, you're you're I gotta wear the, the public radio fifty year anniversary oh, shirt. Yeah. Okay, sure. Our Go ahead. Jack's polo shirt. So oh, it'd be yeah. like Anderson Gavin, Cooper up there. <laughs> Gavin and I both ordered one size too small. I ordered large. Yeah, I also have a large, and I'm larger than you are. So, brag. Um, no, not a brag, not in a good way. Uh, so, uh, both of our shirts are going to be stuck in our armpits. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do the live pod uh, Saturday, January 28th, and then afterwards we'll be bartending at a local <laughs> bar. <laughs> we're gonna slick back our hair. Yeah, but uh, you guys can find out more details. You can RSVP because it is free. It's open to the public, but you we need tickets for that event. You can do that at South Carolina Public Radio I didn't put this at the top, so I'm gonna put it here. But we want to see you guys at our first live taping of. 2023, Mayan Schechter with the state and Jeffrey Collins with the Associated Press will be our guests. Two great friends of the pod. Great, yeah. It's going to be a wonderful time. We've got room it, for about 100 people in our studio. So yeah, we 100 people. See you. So I need at least two or three of you to come with a topic to talk about for the live wind down. Yes. Okay? I want someone to have a topic that uh, will catch us off at <gasps> least a little bit. You know, it's really. my guest. <gasps> <laughs> I'm, I'm still working. I'm still working. Workshopping. Yeah, I'm still working on it. Anyway, so please come. Yes. Please call. Have a topic. I I I'm, I'm I can't wait to see everyone in person. It's yes. gonna be so much fun. If if you want to see my foot, you can. It's gonna be weird. <laughs> Everyone's okay? gonna be excited. <laughs> but yeah, we also will love to hear about your ideas for places we should go tape, and we'll have we'll have exclusive swag or pint glasses which we have not <sighs> dispersed in a while we have so many of them we the can't pint wait glasses to give them away very good but you can only get those in person yes so we would love to see you saturday january 28th at etv studios here in columbia for our live taping and sc public radio's open house so check it out south carolinapublicradio.org and we'll see you there okay yeah but that's great thank you everyone for listening hit them with the credits okay bud Thanks, y'all. And come on, leave us a voicemail. It's the new year, new you. Give us a shout, 803-563-7169. You can also leave us a message on Apple Podcasts. We love those reviews. And you can stay up to date with the latest news on SCETV.org and SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. No, yes. Yes. Oh, good. Yes. (laughs) 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 Yes.